Over the past several decades, newspaper comics have faced a slow but inevitable decline. Newspapers themselves are no longer the fixture they once were in people's everyday routines, and with the internet available at your fingertips, people have turned to more personalized selections of on-demand entertainment. A handful of comics that were too big to fail have managed to keep barreling along despite the rapidly changing media landscape, but often at the expense of quality. However, one comic did manage to avoid the downfall of the comic medium entirely by bowing out while it was on top all the way back in 1995. In doing so, Calvin and Hobbes secured a legacy, not just as one of the best comic strips of all time, but as a genuine piece of art that pushed the boundaries of the medium and captured a shockingly meaningful snapshot of early childhood without ever coming across as heavy-handed or preachy. For those unfamiliar, Calvin and Hobbes follows Calvin, a six-year-old boy living in suburban America and his best friend Hobbes, who appears to him as a living, breathing tiger, but to everyone else as Calvin's beloved stuffed animal. Comic strips swap between viewpoints, contrasting Calvin's often monotonous surroundings with the adventures that he creates in his imagination, providing a peek into a six-year-old's world where every cardboard box is a cloning device and every school desk is a spaceship. Calvin possesses both a childlike enthusiasm for adventure, as well as an equally childlike enthusiasm for escaping the consequences of his actions, which gives his creator, Bill Watterson, an extremely convenient satirical outlet. Calvin's selfish actions are quite typical for a six-year-old boy, but his willfully ignorant excuses for his actions are not often getting drawn into extensive philosophical conversations with Hobbes, who serves as both a moderating influence as well as his partner in crime. The contrast between Calvin's childish actions and his wordy echoing of popular adult attitudes cleverly draws attention to what Bill Watterson clearly views as the less admirable elements of our society. But even when Calvin was talking like an adult, he never acted like anything but a child, and in keeping this aspect of the story consistent, Bill Watterson managed to capture something truly special about early childhood. Calvin and Hobbes captures both the joy of summer vacation as well as the monotony of another day of school. Calvin's focus is on the simple pleasures rotting in front of the TV on a Saturday morning, walks in the woods after getting kicked out of the house for rotting in front of the TV on Saturday morning. He loves dinosaurs and spies and secret clubs. He lives in fear of life's greatest evils, like the monsters under his bed, his babysitter, and of course, the existential dread imposed by our finite lifespan. Even when Calvin and Hobbes chooses to tackle a complex theme, the world is always simple, seen through the eyes of a little kid. Focusing on the most universal aspects of childhood has been a massive boon to the comic's legacy, avoiding the pitfalls associated with an over-reliance on jokes that reference pop culture and current events. But Calvin and Hobbes is truly unique not just for its content, but for a decision that took place outside of the comic strip itself that ensured Calvin and Hobbes would only ever exist on those pages. Unlike many of the other most popular comic strips whose characters have become household names, Calvin and Hobbes was not adapted into an animated film or a TV show. There are no Calvin and Hobbes shirts or toys or video games. There isn't even a Hobbes stuffed animal, and this is not by mistake, but is instead the result of a lengthy legal battle between Bill Watterson, who was bitterly opposed to licensing his characters, and the publishers of the strip, who were equally bitterly opposed to leaving that much money on the table. Bill Watterson felt quite strongly that comics were their own art form, and that expanding his characters' reach through spin-offs and merchandise would only serve to dilute the quality, transforming a very personal transcription of his view of the world into a project designed by committee to turn the most profit possible. His refusal to concede control allowed him to present a narrative that rings just as true with audiences today as it did when it started being written 40 years ago. But it's hard to put into words exactly why, because everyone gets something different out of reading it. Calvin and Hobbes is always witty and often meaningful, but it's just as often quite difficult to categorize. 
It's hard to explain what makes it so great because Calvin and Hobbes is greater than the sum of its parts, an effortlessly weaving series of contrasts that break life down to its most simple components. I'm a little bit older every time I reread Calvin and Hobbes, although perhaps not that much wiser. Despite my best efforts, I have changed as the years have passed, and I find myself appreciating different aspects of Bill Watterson's mastery of cynical humor. I notice jokes I didn't notice before, and sympathize with the adult characters in ways that I just couldn't have as a kid. And as a result, I find myself feeling a similar sympathy for my own extraordinarily patient parents. But the biggest thing that I take away from every reread is that some small part of me can still relate to Calvin. Not just in his imperfections, but in his enthusiasm. Calvin and Hobbes is one of the few things that can still remind me that we really do live in a magical world worth exploring. And for that alone, it has earned its reputation as the last great newspaper comic.